Good morning, everyone. Sorry I can't be there with you today, but I thought I would record this and send it along so that we wouldn't miss the conference today. I'll spend this hour discussing concepts in heterotaxy syndrome, and then next week we can spend the whole hour looking at specimens. First, <clears throat> I just want to introduce my mentors, Stella and Richard von Prague, uh, who taught me what I know about cardiac anatomy uh, and were instrumental in us being able to do what we have been able to do with uh, imaging anatomy correlations and understanding the pathology of congenital heart disease. Uh, we owe these people uh, an enormous debt uh, and I just want to acknowledge that and make sure that everybody knows who these wonderful people are. Stella uh, was a, a Greek lady from Crete, and in addition to teaching us about cardiac anatomy, she also taught us about uh, the Greek language. This is particularly um, relevant in heterotaxy syndrome because the term heterotaxy actually derives from Greek. Uh, heteros, uh, meaning other or uh, different, uh, and taxis, meaning the order or arrangement or classification. So what heterotaxy really uh, means is something other than or different from um, uh, the usual order or arrangement or its mirror image, that is a, 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 a variation uh, from the, the usual way that the organs in the body are organized. There's a long history of uh, trying to understand heterotaxy syndrome, really beginning at this hospital in 1955 with Ivamark, uh, who published <clears throat> first on a, the asplenia syndrome. He recognized it and published a, a rather large monograph uh, in 1955. Uh, Dr. Bob von Mirop, uh, who was at the Gainesville University of Florida for many years uh, in 1962, uh, presented the idea of atrial isomerism, uh, particularly associated with asplenia, both uh, sides of the atria having some characteristics of the right atrium. Uh, then Jim Moeller, uh, who was at the uh, uh, University of Minnesota in 1967, uh, presented the idea that polysplenia was sort of like bilateral left-sidedness. Um, then the von Prags uh, in 1990 uh, emphasized the abnormal venous connections uh, that we see in heterotaxy syndrome. And uh, in 1995, Bob Anderson uh, from London uh, presented uh, the concept of atrial appendage isomerism. I think by this point, everyone had recognized that the atria were never uh, mirror images of each other, exactly like each other, but that the atrial appendages, particularly the pectinate muscle uh, morphology, could be. And that, that, I think, that concept has some validity to it. So heterotaxy has a number of characteristics. One is abnormal symmetry and distribution of usually lateralized organs. So we see this particularly in lungs, liver, and things like that, as we'll see as we go along. Uh, one can also see situs discordance uh, between, say, the abdomen and the thorax, or between the heart and other viscera. Uh, so there's a mixture. And we see syndromic clustering of a number of abnormalities, the statistical associations that we know about associated with heterotaxy syndrome, the things that, for example, go along with either asplenia or polysplenia. But these are just statistical associations, and we have to keep that in mind. So, in fact, the watchwords uh, that I associate with heterotaxy syndrome are variability, because there is remarkable variability, even though we know about these statistical associations. We shouldn't be surprised when they don't uh, actually hold up, as well as unpredictability. In other words, 
<clears throat> we know we're going to be surprised from time to time because of the uh, variability that we see in heterotaxy syndrome. The concepts of bilateral left and right sidedness can be quite useful mnemonic devices to help us remember uh, what these statistical associations are, what goes with what. Like, for example, in asplenia, we often see common AB canal, uh, left ventricular hypoplasia, double outlet right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis, all of these kinds of things go together, but they certainly don't always go together. Uh, and <clears throat> we just uh, have to be careful not to take uh, these concepts of bilateral left and right sidedness too seriously. We know that uh, the viscera, as well as the heart, uh, are um, involved in heterotaxy syndrome. We often see isomeric lungs, bilateral trilobe, bilateral bilobed. Uh, the liver is often midline, extending across the abdomen so that the two lobes are relatively symmetrical. Uh, we can see absence of the spleen or multiple small spleens. Um, particularly in polysplenia, we can see extrahepatic biliary atresia, absence of the gallbladder. Uh, we know that gut malrotation, malposition, is common in heterotaxy syndrome, so that belly pain in patients with this disorder should be taken seriously. Uh, and in roughly 5% of uh, boys with uh, particularly polysplenia may have cryptorchidism. The abnormal symmetry really best applies to the lungs, liver, uh, and the pectinate muscle pattern. In these magnetic resonance images, we can see, for example, here on the left of the screen, uh, uh, the trachea and bronchi in this patient. You see the uh, right bronchus and the left bronchus are both quite long without uh, an early upper lobe branch. This is characteristic of uh, a left bronchus. Uh, so this is a patient with bilateral left bronchi uh, that we often see in patients with polysplenia syndrome. On the right side of the screen here, we see a trachea and bronchi with early low branch, upper lobe branches on both sides. So this is much more characteristic of a right bronchus. Uh, so this is bilateral right bronchi, which we often see in the asplenia syndrome. We can also see abnormal symmetry of the liver. Here in this uh, example, you see the liver extends all the way across. The two lobes of the liver are relatively symmetrical in this case, and we often see symmetrical hepatic venous drainage. Here you can see the right lobe associated with the inferior vena cava, the left lobe coming in separately on the other side. On the other hand, uh, certain organs remain asymmetrical even though their positioning may be abnormal. In this case, the positioning is normal, but uh, the organs are, are asymmetrical. For example, here's a left-sided stomach uh, in this patient, a right-sided gallbladder uh, in the other patient here. So these, uh, we never see, for example, uh, two gallbladders, one on each side, or two stomachs, one on each side. They tend to be um, asymmetrical, but uh, they may be positioned abnormally. If we first consider the venous anatomy in heterotaxy syndrome, we see that there are some similarities and some differences between the asplenia or right isomerism and polysplenia or left isomerism groups of patients. For example, in um, asplenia, we virtually always see an intact inferior vena cava. It's quite rare in this syndrome to see uh, interruption of the inferior vena cava. We often see bilateral superior vena cavae uh, that drain usually to the ipsilateral side of a common atrium or to a separate atria. Uh, and we usually don't see a coronary sinus uh, in asplenia syndrome. It's either absent or um, not uh, evident uh, in these. In contrast, in polysplenia, uh, Interruption of the inferior vena cava with an azagous draining the lower part of the body to the superior vena cava occurs in roughly 85% of patients, at least according to our uh, postmortem uh, examinations. On the other hand, bilateral SVCs are also common here, just like in uh, the asplenia syndrome. Uh, 
pulmonary venous drainage uh, abnormalities occur in both of these as well. Uh, in asplenia, we often see totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection to a systemic vein, not to the atria, but to a systemic vein like the superior vena cava or the uh, portal sinus or some other uh, venous structure. And this occurs probably in, in more than half of patients, maybe close to two-thirds of patients with asplenia syndrome. We can also see a single atrial orifice of the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins may form a confluence and then drain into the atrium as a single orifice. Whereas in polysplenia, we usually see normal pulmonary venous connection. The pulmonary veins usually connect normally to the back of the atrium. But we may see abnormal drainage, but this seems mostly to be due to abnormal placement of the interatrial septum, which we'll see a little bit later. This is a subxiphoid view in a patient with asplenia syndrome. And as we play it, you can see that there is this little strand in the atrial uh, area that uh, is the residual of the interatrial septum. And there are bilateral superior vena cavas in this case. You can see with color flow uh, the jet coming in uh, on each side. Uh, also in the asplenia syndrome, we s often see juxtaposition of the aorta and the inferior vena cava. In this case, if we put this in motion, you can see that this is the pulsating aorta here, more medial. The inferior vena cava is a little more lateral. The spine is back here. Both of these are on the same side uh, of the spine, uh, typical of the uh, asplenia syndrome. You can see the inferior vena cava then go up into uh, the floor of the atrium. In this case, we see anomalous hepatic venous connection. Putting it in motion, you can see the left hepatic veins here, the right hepatic veins and inferior vena cava draining in uh, on the right side. Uh, with separate left hepatic veins on the other side of this uh, large uh, atrium. Uh, hepatic venous drainage anomalies occur with both uh, asplenia and polysplenia. This happens to be a case of asplenia, but we can see uh, uh, variation in hepatic venous drainage in, in both. Here is a long axis view of the inferior vena cava showing that in fact it was intact in this patient typical of asplenia syndrome. This is an example of interrupted inferior vena cava with azicus vein draining the lower part of the body. If we uh, put this in motion, you can see that the aorta is here, and there's another vessel at the same anterior posterior level, which is the azicus vein in this case. It goes up behind the atrium. It doesn't connect with the atrium. Here's another example with the aorta medial here and the azicus vein uh, on the left side in this case, and this just illustrates that an azagous vein can be on either side. In fact, over here in the anatomical specimen, it's on both sides. Here's another example. In this case, the aorta pulsating here is uh, shown in red with color flow and blue in the azagous vein because flow, of course, is going in the opposite direction in these two vessels. So this is a typical appearance uh, at the diaphragm of uh, an interrupted inferior vena cava with uh, azagous vein. Now we also want to see the superior connection of the azagous vein and in this case this is right atrium superior vena cava draining down and here's the azagous vein draining up over the ipsilateral pulmonary artery to reach the superior vena cava. And when we turn color flow on, you can see flow coming toward the transducer up the azagous vein into the superior vena cava and then down uh, into the right atrium. So this is the superior termination of the azagous vein in the superior vena cava. When we have uh, an interrupted IVC with azagous, we also again uh, have a direct hepatic venous drainage to the floor of the atrium. And here you can see uh, 
three separate hepatic veins coming in in close proximity uh, to each other into the floor uh, of the right atrium here. And with color flow mapping you can see flow uh, going to and fro into these. And this is just another example of how we can see the superior vena cava and the azagous vein uh, draining into it from a high uh, parasternal view. These are of course black blood magnetic resonance uh, images in a patient with um, uh, heterotaxy syndrome. If we start this one in motion, I'm going to stop it so I can control it more carefully here. What we see is um, a couple of things here for systemic venous drainage anomalies. One, we see hepatic veins here on the right plus the inferior vena cava, which is this medial vessel here uh, coming up on the right side. There you can see the IVC going down through the liver. There it picks up the right hepatic vein. But now watch on the left side there you can see another left hepatic vein comes in separately uh, in this patient. If we go up above you can see that there is a right superior vena cava only there right here uh, and there is a left denominate vein coming across in front. There you can see it coming across in front, in front of the uh, brachycephalic arteries uh, to reach the right superior vena cava. So this patient has only a right superior vena cava uh, and no left superior vena cava. If we look at the one on the other side, uh, we'll see that it has, um <coughs> as we come up into the atrium, you can see that there are bilateral superior vena cava. There's the left one uh, here, there, right here coming down into the atrium. And we'll see that there's also a right one on the other side there, uh, this coming down into the atrium. So this is bilateral superior vena cava. Uh, you see that the uh, inferior vena cava in this one is left-sided. This is the inferior vena cava here uh, and we can follow it up. There you can follow it down through the liver and there it, pick, it goes into a right hepatic vein there, or sorry, a left hepatic vein, uh, and then that drains across the midline over to the right along with the right hepatic vein. So sometimes you can see crossing just below the diaphragm of the uh, inferior veins uh, in patients with uh, particularly with asplenia syndrome. And in this case, they're bilateral superior vena cavae. Now let's look at one other feature here. You can see these are the pulmonary veins. These are the lower veins, upper veins, uh, and they come together to form this vertical vein, uh, descending vertical vein going below the diaphragm. So there are upper veins there, lower veins, and then it comes below the diaphragm. And notice that it connects with this um, sinus here, it's the portal sinus, and we know it's the portal sinus because we can follow the portal vein right here coming up from the mesentery into it. So there's the portal vein, you can see it coming up out of the mesentery and coming into the portal sinus, uh, and it's typical for uh, total veins uh, uh, below the diaphragm to join the portal sinus like this. You can see how it does that. Same thing on the other side. Uh, if we look at this, uh, you can see there's another vertical vein coming below the diaphragm and it's joining this portal sinus as well. It's a little more tortuous getting there, uh, but this has lower lobe veins, then it has middle lobe veins, and then just above that, right up here, you can see another set of veins, which uh, there, that this is another set separate from these with the upper lobes coming in. And then we'll see an ascending vertical vein arise from that, this little structure right here. Uh, and we can follow it up toward the innominate vein right there where it drains into the innominate vein. So this is mixed uh, venous drainage in this patient with heterotaxy syndrome. Um, we can see venous anatomy in polysplenia. Very often there is a um, large coronary sinus with a persistent left superior vena cava draining to it. Um, in this case, we can see a large uh, coronary sinus here, and if we follow it over, we'll see there's a persistent left superior vena cava here that's coming down from above in front of the pulmonary veins and coming in. There's also a right superior vena cava on the other side, which drains directly into the right atrium. So this is 
uh, bilateral cavi, but with the left cava to the coronary sinus, as we can see there. Uh, this is an example of uh, interrupted inferior vena cava with azagus in uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Here's the aorta, here's the azagus vein. As we follow it up, you can see that it passes behind the atria, doesn't connect with the atria. Those are pulmonary veins coming in, and it continues up, uh, and we'll see that it's going to connect with the superior vena cava right there. And then if we follow the superior vena cava, we see that it comes down and connects with the left pulmonary artery there, right there. There's the anastomosis. This is a Kawashima operation. There's some narrowing of the right pulmonary artery there as well, but this is a, a Kawashima. Uh, and in order to get the hepatic venous blood that we were talking about into it, uh, here's the azix again. We're following it back down. Look what happens right here. See, there's a little channel that's been created there. Those are the hepatic veins right there in the liver, uh, and they've been channeled into the azagous vein below. Uh, this is a basket amadeo operation or connection of the hepatic veins into the uh, azagous vein so that the hepatic factor, whatever it is, uh, can be distributed to the lungs. Uh, another uh, example of some venous anatomy. Uh, here we can see uh, a complete common AV canal over here, of course, but uh, you can see in this case that the pulmonary veins in this patient with asplenia drain pretty normally back to uh, the back of the atrium. This occurs in a, maybe 15-20% a of patients with um, asplenia syndrome. We can see normal uh, pulmonary venous connection. Uh, on the other side over here, we have a, um, <coughs> some very unusual uh, systemic and pulmonary venous drainage. You can see again, here's this uh, inferior vena cava coming up here, and we'll see it go into this uh, right hepatic vein there, which then crosses over uh, and joins into the floor uh, of the atrium on the other side. Notice here that there's a superior vena cava coming in on this side. The other thing to notice is that there are also pulmonary veins that are coming in on this side uh, as well as uh, on the left side over here. Uh, so this patient has a complex uh, anomaly. This is a, a summary of that. You can see their bilateral cavi, one to the coronary sinus, one directly to the atrium. Here's that inferior vena cava coming up and crossing over uh, to join the uh, other hepatic vein draining into the floor of the atrium. This is something that we can sometimes see uh, in uh, patients with heterotaxy syndrome. And you can see also a very high entrance of a, a renal vein into the systemic venous uh, chambers. And in this one, we can see the atrial septum here, right atrium, left atrium, left pulmonary veins to left atrium, right pulmonary veins to right atrium. So this is a um, ipsilateral pulmonary venous drainage that we see sometimes in patients with uh, polysplenia syndrome. Just another example of, uh, of uh, pulmonary venous drainage to a systemic vein. This is supracardiac. Here you can see individual pulmonary veins that are quite small draining into this sort of horizontal confluence which then goes up around the side of the pulmonary artery here uh, and drains into uh, the anominate vein. So this is supracardiac, uh, totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection. There you can see it. Uh, and this, uh, this can certainly occur in het heterotaxy syndrome, and the very small individual pulmonary veins are fairly characteristic of heterotaxy syndrome, possibly because pulmonary stenosis is so frequent uh, in these patients. Uh, Another example below the diaphragm by echo. This is the uh, vertical venous channel here, the inferior vena cava, and the descending aorta. And we can follow this up uh, into the chest and see it picking up uh, pulmonary veins on each side and their upper veins coming into it here. And then we can follow this back down. Uh, this is uh, left upper, right upper. They don't connect with the left atrium here. In fact, this will come down below. Uh, the diaphragm and into the uh, abdomen 
as we saw in the magnetic resonance below before. Here's a lower lobe vein. Uh, this is the vertical descending vein coming down <coughs> about to cross the diaphragm here. Uh, and in long axis view or in, a, in a, a sagittal plane view, this is the vertical vein here with right veins entering it. The pulmonary artery is a little bit higher. This is right upper, right lower pulmonary vein. You can see that by angling off to the side and then see them come back into the vertical vein and then we can follow it as it goes below the diaphragm. And these are left veins on the other side. We've just angled off to the left side to see that. You can sometimes see these from a suprasternal notch view, particularly the upper veins as well. Occasionally we see uh, veins draining directly to the superior vena cava. Here you can see the vertical venous confluence and it's going to loop right around this left pulmonary artery. Uh, and drain into a persistent left superior vena cava. These can sometimes get obstructed here between uh, the uh, pulmonary artery and the bronchus. Here you can see it looping up and coming into the superior vena cava, coming down into the right atrium. Sometimes we can see this better from a peristernal view. Here you see the cava, and these are the veins coming up, probably through an azygous connection uh, into the superior vena cava. This is an example of a single orifice, single ostium of the pulmonary veins into the atrium in a patient with uh, asplenia syndrome. There are the right pulmonary veins, left pulmonary veins as they come together in a little confluence behind the atrium, and then it drains in through this single orifice here uh, into the back of the atrium. With color flow, you can see it coming in. Sometimes this single orifice can become obstructed, possibly because of the uh, uh, flow acceleration across it and then fibrosis uh, of the ostium uh, over time. And as we saw in one of the magnetic resonance images, you can see sometimes relatively normal looking uh, connection of the pulmonary veins in asplenia syndrome. On the other hand, these veins are quite small. Uh, and as we said before, this is a problem that we sometimes see in uh, the asplenia syndrome, very hypoplastic pulmonary veins often associated with pulmonary stenosis or atresia. And ipsilateral pulmonary venous connection in uh, polysplenia, here you can see the atrial septum is deviated, it's not as it is in the normal over here, and that allows the right pulmonary veins access to the right atrium and left pulmonary veins to the left. While this is fairly apparent uh, in this uh, subxiphoid view in this patient, it's much more apparent uh, in an apical view that we'll see now. Here you can see how the uh, interatrial septum is deviated to the left with left veins here, right veins here. The veins connect pretty normally, but their drainage is abnormal because of the uh, abnormal position of the interatrial septum. Uh, this is uh, a magnetic resonance uh, uh, example of this. Here you can see the right atrium, the left atrium, the atrial septum here in the middle. And as we continue to follow this up, you'll see those are right veins here coming back into the right atrium, left veins here into the left. Instead of the atrial septum being positioned as it usually is like this, it's much more leftward. Probably that's because the origin of the primary atrial septum uh, from the back wall of the atrium uh, was uh, abnormally positioned too far to the left because of the uh, abnormal situs that we see uh, in patients with heterotaxy syndrome. The, the left-right uh, cues were not normal. And there you can see again the ipsilateral pulmonary venous drainage. The atrial septum uh, can be uh, quite abnormal as well. Here you see the strand of atrial tissue that we saw before. Uh, and here you can see it in the specimen. This is just a little residual bit of atrial septum that we see running through uh, a common atrium uh, in many patients with uh, the asplenia syndrome. Another aspect of atrial anatomy are the atrial appendages. Here on this side, you can see a big atrial appendage that's left-sided. There's also dextrocardia. But in this case, it's a left-sided appendage that looks like a right atrial appendage. You can see these pectinate muscles extending out of it, typical of what we see for a right uh, atrial appendage. On the other hand, if we look at the other atrial appendage, it's this. And if we follow it up, 
you can see it come up like this. It's a very small appendage. There are pectinate muscles only within the appendage. If we look down here in this atrium, it has a very small neck right there. And then as it comes into the atrium, the atrium is quite smooth-walled. We don't see pectinate muscles around. Uh, so this uh, is asymmetry of the atrial appendages. On the other hand, in this example, you can see that there are two appendages on either side of the vascular pedicle. This is the aorta, the obstructed pulmonary artery here. Here's a left-sided atrial appendage and a right-sided atrial appendage, and they both have characteristics of the right atrial appendage. They're big, they're pectinate muscles that extend out around uh, the atrium on both sides. So sometimes you can see symmetry, sometimes uh, asymmetry of the atrial appendages. Uh, and we've already seen the strand here. In asplenia syndrome, more often than not, complete common AV canal uh, is present. Uh, sometimes we do see two separate atrioventricular valves, but uh, uh, this is uh, less common than having a complete common AV canal, often unbalanced, favoring the right ventricle. In contrast, in polysplenia syndrome, we often see separate atrioventricular valves. We can also see, maybe in close to half the time, either an AV canal defect or an ASD primum. The AV canal, uh, we often see a common AV canal in patients with asplenia. Here you see a complete common AV canal with a large VSD, large interatrial communication, and a common AV valve here. We can also see this in a, this uh, angiogram, uh, magnetic resonance angiogram, and we're looking at it at the valve on FOSS, and you can see it here. There's the, well, big common AV valve here extending all the way across uh, the atrium. So this is a typical complete common AV canal that we see in, in patients often with uh, asplenia syndrome. Uh, in polysplenia, more often we see two separate AV valves. Here's a left AV valve, here's a smaller right AV valve in this case, but two separate AV valves. This patient happens to have double outlet right ventricle, and you can see there's aortic to tricuspid uh, continuity in this case. Uh, <coughs> in this example, we again see a big common atrium common AV canal that's completely aligned with this right ventricle. We don't even see a hint of a left ventricle in this patient. So this is an, a completely unbalanced AV canal favoring the right ventricle, uh, and we sometimes see this in patients with asplenia syndrome. In the asplenia syndrome, we often see left ventricular hypoplasia or even absence. On the other hand, in a significant number of patients, probably more than half, there are two adequate ventricles. Uh, and many, if not most, of these patients could undergo a biventricular repair. In contrast, in polysplenia, two normal-sized ventricles is uh, by far the most common arrangement. This is really the standard for, for polysplenia syndrome. And the great majority of these patients can also undergo a two-ventricle repair. The ventricles in this case, this is a patient with polysplenia syndrome. We see a normal-looking left ventricle here, a normal-looking right ventricle here, two separate uh, ventricles, both uh, good size, uh, which is uh, uh, what we often see in patients with uh, polysplenia, less so in patients with asplenia. But here, interestingly, uh, usually we see a small left ventricle, but in this case, we see a small right ventricle. There's a complete common AV canal here, but it's unbalanced favoring the left ventricle. Here's a free wall papillary muscle, smooth septal surface, probably a moderator band there in the smaller right ventricle. So just to show you the uh, variability and unpredictability that we see uh, in many patients with uh, heterotaxy syndrome. And this one uh, is an example of uh, essentially just a big right ventricle here with double outlet. Uh, here's the infundibular septum. Turns out to be an aorta and pulmonary artery. So this one 
even though it has just a right ventricle, has a small aorta and a big pulmonary artery. In this case, uh, we can see again two good sized ventricles, the right ventricle being a little bit smaller, but uh, perfectly adequate for a two ventricle repair in this case of polyspleen. This is a 3D reconstruction of a heart uh, from a magnetic resonance uh, imaging study in a patient with uh, the asplenia syndrome. If we make the blood pool here transparent, we can look inside and see the uh, myocardium, which is shown in brown. This is right ventricle on this side, left ventricle here. If we look to the back, you can see the strand of atrial tissue that we often see uh, in patients with uh, the asplenia syndrome. So here's this little strand of atrial tissue. You can see there's a big primum defect, uh, essentially a common atrium. There are bilateral superior vena cavae, as we see draining in up here. The inferior vena cava here drains further uh, to the left. Um, you can see here's this little strand of atrial tissue, so it's uh, more or less midline. The pulmonary veins uh, come in back here as a single orifice in the back. If we look at the ventricles, you can see that both ventricles are reasonable size. The RV is a little bigger than the LV. Uh, the aorta is here aligned with the right ventricle. You can see it again from above. Here's the uh, aorta coming out like this. It's to the right. The pulmonary artery uh, is here. It's aligned with the left ventricle. Uh, and there is narrowing uh, of the pulmonary outflow, uh, typical of, uh, of asplenia syndrome. And here is the PA in the back uh, behind uh, the aorta and to the, a little bit to the left. So this is a patient with transposition. <coughs> this is the infundibular septum up here between the PA in the back and the aorta in the front. Um, this is a D-loop, so theoretically one could <coughs> if needed, enlarge the VSD up into this area, fix the canal, uh, and baffle the left ventricle to the aorta, possibly with doing a, a root translocation in this, in this case, and then using a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. One would also have to somehow connect the left cava over to the right side uh, and baffle this more or less left-sided inferior vena cava over to the right side as well, but that uh, should be relatively straightforward. So this is a fairly typical example of uh, the uh, asplenia uh, heart uh, in a 3D reconstruction. In asplenia, a conotruncal anomaly is the rule. It is extremely rare to see patients with normally related great arteries. The great majority have transposition or double outlet right ventricle. Also, pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary atresia are common in asplenia syndrome. Probably more than half of patients have uh, at least significant pulmonary stenosis. In contrast, in polysplenia, normally related great arteries is by far the most common. Some patients, a relatively small number, have double outlet right ventricle, but in many of these there is aortic to tricuspid valve fibrous continuity, that is, absence of a complete subaortic conus. There are, of course, some cases of polysplenia with double outlet right ventricle that do have a subaortic conus, but uh, they're in the minority. Subaortic stenosis also occurs in some patients with polysplenia syndrome. This is an example of asplenia syndrome with double outlet right ventricle and pulmonary stenosis. If we put this in motion, we can see the anterior aorta plus the pulmonary outflow posteriorly here, both arising from this right ventricle. And notice that there is significant pulmonary stenosis with a narrowing here under the pulmonary outflow tract. The aorta is perfectly unobstructed with a normal aortic arch, again unobstructed, but there is quite significant subpulmonary obstruction. In the other example, 
we again see in asplenia syndrome a patient with double outlet right ventricle but in this case it's the aorta that's the small vessel and the pulmonary artery that's larger so even though some cases uh, of asplenia syndrome um, or most cases have pulmonary stenosis occasionally we see ones that uh, uh, have uh, aortic outflow obstruction in a large pulmonary artery here we see the branch pulmonary arteries on either side and if we trace them up you can see they connect to the larger vessel here on the left in contrast the aorta on the right uh, gives rise to brachiocephalic arteries here so this is um, an example of a small aorta a large pulmonary artery and then this is the ductus arteriosus the vessel that now connects uh, the pulmonary trunk with the descending aorta and you see that there is a severe coarctation at the junction between this hypoplastic aortic arch and the descending aorta. Again this just uh, illustrates the variability and unpredictability uh, that we often see in patients with heterotaxy syndrome. In polysplenia we typically see normally related great arteries but again this is a patient with double outlet right ventricle. Here's the large aorta. Uh, aortic dilatation, by the way, is a feature that we uh, see in uh, a number of patients with polysplenia syndrome. There is a ventricular septal defect here that's under the aorta. And notice this is aortic valve leaflet. This is tricuspid valve leaflet. There's aortic to tricuspid fibrous continuity here. On the other side, we have an example of normally related great arteries. Here's the aorta coming from the left ventricle, a large pulmonary artery here from the right ventricle. Uh, this patient has uh, an atrial septal defect uh, and partially anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, um, which is causing dilatation of the right ventricle uh, and dilatation of the right ventricular outflow tract. Here we see a very large uh, pulmonary artery arising from the right ventricle. But this patient has two normal ventricles, a normal left ventricle here, a normal anterior right ventricle that's somewhat dilated, uh, and then uh, normally related great arteries. This is uh, quite common in patients with polysplenia syndrome. In uh, this example of a patient with polysplenia syndrome, we see a large coronary sinus an atrial septal defect. The left ventricle is here with the mitral valve. Right ventricle is here with the tricuspid valve. And in fact, we have double outlet right ventricle in this case. The aorta here, subaortic VSD, pulmonary artery here. Notice there's aortic to tricuspid fibrous continuity. Here's infundibular septum and the outflow to the pulmonary artery. So this is uh, the kind of double outlet right ventricle that we often see in patients with polysplenia syndrome. Again, there are two well-formed ventricles, two separate atrioventricular valves, uh, and the aorta, which is quite large in this case, the VSD is subaortic. There's aortic to tricuspid fibrous continuity. Here's the pulmonary outflow, probably mild pulmonary stenosis, but not, uh, not a major amount of pulmonary stenosis in this case. One important secondary complication that we see in many patients with particularly polysplenia syndrome uh, are AV malformations, pulmonary AV malformations. Um, these tend to occur after a bidirectional glen or a Kawashima operation, which is a bidirectional glen uh, using the superior vena cava to which uh, the azagus drains the lower part of the body. This results in all of the systemic venous return entering the pulmonary arteries directly except for uh, pulmon uh, uh, hepatic venous drainage. Uh, there seems to be, as you probably know, something in hepatic venous blood that's important to maintain integrity of the pulmonary circulation. Uh, so patients who have had a Kawashima uh, and have the hepatic veins draining directly back to the heart instead of to the lungs are at increased risk for AV malformations. Similarly, 
uh, we see dilatation of the aorta and dilatation of the pulmonary arteries in many patients with particularly polysplenia syndrome. Um, this can uh, uh, cause compression of the airway um, and um, also the fact that the relationship between the bronchi and the airways is uh, abnormal in some patients with uh, heterotaxy syndrome may also contribute to airway obstruction. In any case, we can see uh, air trapping or um, failure to, to ventilate certain lobes of the lung uh, in patients with heterotaxy syndrome. Outcomes in patients with heterotaxy syndrome has been somewhat poor, uh, at least uh, in the past. Uh, these are outcome data from the 70s through 2010 uh, from Scandinavia. And you can see that in this uh, example of asplenia syndrome that the 10-year survival is only about 35 or 40 percent. Um, <clears throat> this is survival related to surgery. Patients who did not need surgery, of course, uh, uh, are likely to do better. These were patients who didn't need surgery immediately, but only after four weeks. Uh, these were patients who underwent surgery less than four weeks, and these were patients who did not undergo surgery at all, probably uh, just palliative treatment in these patients. So you can see the results here uh, were pretty uh, unappetizing. This is a, another study a little bit later looking at patients from 1997 to 2010, so uh, removing that early 20-year period. And you can see that the more recent cohort has a, a survival out to five years or, or so of a little better than 80 percent, whereas the earlier cohort, it was only about 50 or 60 percent. In polysplenia, the results uh, uh, from the Scandinavian study were not much better. Uh, here again, you can see that uh, by uh, 15 years, about half of patients uh, had died. Uh, and there were lots of uh, complications, so pacemakers, uh, some palliative surgery, single ventricle palliation, and only 10 out of the 38 patients had uh, undergone a biventricular repair with only seven uh, alive. But it's important to keep in mind that 37% of the deaths in this series were from non-cardiac anomalies, things like GI problems, biliary atresia, et cetera. These are more recent data. This is from uh, Bambinje Su Hospital in Rome, the, the upper graph, part of the graph here. The rest of these are a compilation of prior studies. This was the Scandinavian study that we had looked at before. Uh, but this study is, is much more optimistic. This is right atrial isomerism, or uh, you can think of it as sort of being asplenia syndrome. And these are fairly long-term results, out to 30 years with some number of patients. Um, and you can see that at 20 years, the survival here is a little better uh, than 80% uh, in these patients. Uh, so this is a, seems to be a major improvement over previous. This is the last uh, 20 years of, uh, of uh, experience. This is uh, left atrial appendage isomerism or polysplenia and you can see the results here uh, are even better. This is about 90 percent 20 year survival where, where they had significant numbers and again these are the same studies that we've looked at before particularly the Scandinavian study down here that had uh, particularly disastrous results. The rest of these are various studies that have been reported uh, over the years. This is one of the ones that I, I showed you before. Um, and there's, uh, so you can see the later the study uh, is, the, the better the outcomes seem to be. Uh, and in this case, uh, again, 20 year survival of better than 90% uh, in these patients with left atrial appendage isomerism or uh, polysplenia syndrome. Uh, this was a recently published study last year uh, of outcomes of prenatally diagnosed uh, fetal heterotaxy. 
Uh, this was a meta-analysis of a number of published uh, reports. Uh, this uh, involved uh, 16 articles with about 600 and almost 650 uh, fetuses. Uh, and they divided it by left and right atrial appendage isomerism, although it wasn't totally clear what criteria were used uh, to make these diagnoses. But if we look at uh, both left and right atrial appendage isomerism, at least in the fetal studies, you can see that um, uh, AV canal defects uh, were relatively frequent, more so in right atrial appendage isomerism, but certainly more than I would have guessed in left atrial appendage isomerism. Uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, again, in two-thirds, as we've said before, in, uh, in uh, asplenia and about a third in uh, polysplenia. This is because tetralogy type of double outlet occurs uh, in some of these patients. Some of these uh, um, descriptions here are a little hard to understand. What malposition actually means is not well defined. Uh, bilateral cavi. Uh, and a little less than half of the uh, asplenias and about a quarter of the polysplenias, I would have thought it would have been a little more frequent. Uh, interrupted IVC in 90%, we've seen 85%, so that's certainly uh, consistent. And total veins in 42%, I would have thought it would have been more like 60% or so, but it's, it's not that far off. What happened to these patients? About a quarter of these and about a third of these um, had um, termination of pregnancy. There was a small uh, fetal demise uh, group. Uh, and then uh, postnatal, um, <clears throat> about 17% of these died, whereas a third of the asplenias died, uh, many of these uh, after uh, surgical uh, attempts. So you can see that the, the results uh, from fetal diagnosis are, are a little worse than uh, than what we uh, saw in the series diagnosed postnatally, uh, but uh, not uh, so dramatically worse. But still, this is clearly not a, a solved problem uh, and an area where we, we need to uh, improve our outcomes. One of the problems with this um, report uh, is um, shown here. You can see that they talk about conotruncal anomalies in 40% um, of patients with asplenia, TGA in 21%. That means that 60% had some kind of, right, of outflow tract abnormality um, and some kind of conotruncal anomaly. But uh, we would think it's, it's much closer to 100% uh, seeing patients with normally related great arteries. And uh, asplenia is, uh, is very, very rare. So I, I don't quite know how to square this. Uh, with uh, what we already know about um, asplenia syndrome. It seems like some of the results here are not uh, really uh, congruous with what we know uh, about uh, these disorders. And so it sort of makes me wonder about the, the validity of a lot of this uh, particular report.